And in these times of uncertainty, it's all the more important that we keep collaborating, informing and inspiring each other so that we can be smarter and better tomorrow. Welcome to the Pakhuis de Zeiger livecast. Welcome everybody. My name is Lars Boering and together with AD Peters today, I'm uh, the host of the WordPress Photo House number three, the live cast. Today we will talk about the photo book. WordPress Photo is uh, a foundation that connects the world to the stories that matter. And the photo book is one of these uh, means to, to do that. WordPress Photo House is a location in Amsterdam where uh, we are based with our office, but also in a public space and where we have the PhotoCube bookshop. So for us to talk about photo books is a very good and natural thing uh, at this moment. WordPress Photo is generously supported by the Dutch Postcode Lottery, um, also by PwC and Egon. And uh, we're looking forward to talk to you today about the photo book. Uh, we have our guests here. And first of all, uh, Edi, Welcome. Um, Thank you. Tell, tell, us the, tell everybody a little bit about yourself yeah. in a short background of what you stand for, where you come from. I'm, uh, I'm 62. Um, I've been, um, I started my working life at the newspaper here in Amsterdam, the Volkskrant, Dutch, uh, Dutch national, national newspaper. Um, several functions. I ended up more or less as uh, head of the photo department. So that's where my love for photography uh, uh, came up. And... Um, I quit my job to uh, do something different in the second half of my life. I started uh, the first uh, weblog on photography. That was 2003, a long time ago. Uh, seven years ago, I um, founded the uh, PhotoQ Bookshop. Yep. And last year, it was taken over by WordPress Photo. Yeah, good. Yeah. Tell us a little bit. We, 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 we'd like to introduce ourselves a little bit by the, our love for the photo book. And, yeah. and we brought some of our favorites with us. Yeah. Let, uh, let you start with that. Uh, yeah. Gregory, help and tell us a little bit about the three photo books that, ma that are very dear to you. Yes, uh, Gregory Halpin is, uh, I think it's already three years ago uh, um, uh, since it was published. But it's still uh, a great book. Uh, it's inspiring. It, uh, he walks more or less from somewhere in the desert east of uh, Los Angeles to the Pacific coast. Um, and you see special photography. Uh, you are, every picture is not only beautiful, but also kind of a riddle. What am I looking at? Um, it is uh, great colors. Um, and in the end, it gives you a, a picture of yeah, what's going on in the United States, I guess. Good. Another one uh, after this one? Yeah. Um, we uh, switched to uh, Laia Abril. She's a Spanish photographer. Um, I don't know exactly, but I think 33. And she started um, a series of projects on misogyny, which is uh, quite uh, daring, I would say, um, because, uh, and, and this one is about uh, abortion. So the book is called On Abortion. And um, uh, it's, uh, it's a heavy subject. You might think, uh, will you ever sell a book on such a heavy thing? Uh, but nevertheless, uh, she combines own pictures, historic work, um, personal stories of people uh, uh, who uh, um, uh, uh, were aborted, um, who went through an abortion. Um, and um, it's a very important subject. Uh, 47,000 people, uh, women, die each year. Uh, millions have very big problems in getting uh, in touch with uh, people who can do uh, 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 a good abortion. Yeah. yeah. And your third and one? And the third one is a South African artist, uh, Sanele Moholi. Um, she makes pictures of herself all the time, and, um, but very playful on one hand. On the other side, it's always serious as well. It's about being a woman, it's about being a black woman, it's also sometimes about being a lesbian, um, and it refers very often to classical photography. Um, yeah, and she, she's in a, sitting in a hotel room, and then she thinks up a subject, and she dresses herself up and um, makes a great picture. Yeah, great. You selected three? Yeah. I selected two. 
uh, although uh, I have many more uh, photo books to share. One of the things that uh, always uh, struck me with photo books is uh, I see them and I really want to buy them. And uh, one of the photo books that I found uh, a couple of years back at Unseen, uh, uh, published by Kera, was the book Son of uh, Christopher Anderson. There he is, it's his son. And uh, I like it because it's a, it's a classic for, uh, example now of a photojournalist that uh, turned his camera to his family when he uh, became a father. And, um, and it has become a very beautiful document of the first year uh, of his family and of his son. And for me, this was a book that really spoke to me, not just because of the, uh, the beauty of the pictures, but also the, the whole story behind it and, uh, and this transformation uh, that uh, took place. And uh, another book from the, which I, is very dear to me is, is the book by uh, Takashi, Takahashi Homa. Uh, it's called Trails. And I selected this one uh, because I, I find it an interesting way of telling a very simple story. Um, it is the trail of uh, a deer hunt, but it's also taking you through this journey, through this landscape. Uh, it takes you at the end also through some painting uh, and uh, the book cover is also uh, done in a special way with, uh, with bullet holes. And for me, this was an example of how you can make a very simple story beautifully photographed, but also combine it in many forms and layers. And I think today, um, that is also why we have this program today, AD, because mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the storytelling is, is something that is, can be very rich. Yeah. And I think with these five examples, we can exactly show uh, the, the richness and the, the diversity that you have in the making of the photo book, but also how the photo book uh, presents itself. It goes in many directions. Um, yeah. I, um, we're going to talk about it later with uh, Claudia Heinemann and uh, Robert Knott and uh, Antoinette de Jong. Um, we'll, uh, we'll give attention to a, a, a great uh, young Hong Kong photographer, Lam Yek Fai, and um, we end up with... Uh, Yannick Bouilly, uh, photo book expert. Um, just a half an hour ago, I bumped into uh, Kadir von Lohuis and uh, Clément uh, Sakumani um, of uh, Noor Images. And there is another way that you can do something with photography, and that's a graphic novel. Yeah. So they gave me this book um, uh, about Stanley Green, the life of Stanley Green, the famous photographer who did uh, a, a lot of war photography in Chechnya, other places. Um, had a super, had a very interesting life. Uh, was a great uh, uh, colleague, etc. Um, here you see him becoming uh, an assistant of uh, W. Eugene Smith. And uh, um, anyway, um, it's a it's an interesting biography, and you can, um, if you would like to buy it, 20, 25 euros somewhere in between. Um, go to noimages.com, and you can get it. Photo books in many forms, yeah, many many shapes, and um, but also always made by storytellers. And today we start off with Claudia. Um, thank you for being with us in the studio, um, Edi. Yeah, you Cla selected uh, the, her book specially. Well, actually, I would say not just one book, but no. a, a series of books. Yeah. So it's uh, yeah, that is another form of the photo book. It is a box with five books, I guess. Um, and um, I don't want to scare everybody, but it's uh, the first part of a trilogy. Um, Claudia Heinemann uh, was already rather well known in the photo book world with uh, publication of uh, Enduring Srebrenica and uh, more recently Wolfskinder. For Wolfskinder, she uh, turned to the subject of uh, uh, the end of World War II and uh, what kind of implications it had for uh, people that uh, were caught in the middle of uh, Germans uh, getting back and, uh, and Russians taking uh, things over. Um, and um, Claudia, what is uh, Siberian Exiles about, the, this new book? Uh, this new book is about the deportations from the Baltic states to Siberia. Um, while I was working on the photo book about the Wolfskinder, I often heard about the deportations. So that made me curious and, and, and I thought when I finished that book, I will continue with this topic. It started also at the end of the Second World War, I guess. 
Um, no, the, the the Baltic states had three different uh, occupations. The first was by the Soviets in 90, 1940, second by the German, and then again in 1944 by the Soviets. And they had two big mass deportations in 1941 and 1948. And the, the book is about that mass deportations. Why were they deported to uh, this uh, place where I think this week it was 38 degrees, but that's... <clears throat> Why? Because um, um, the Soviet Union wanted to, to have working countries that follow their ide ideology and to, to break that uh, resistance uh, people, all the enemies of, of the country were sent to, to gulag camps or were deported. So the system was often that men were, were uh, convicted and that they would be sent, they were sent to the gulag camps, but the whole family, uh, the wife, children, her brothers, sisters, they were deported to remote areas. It was massive, wasn't it? Hundreds yes. of thousands. 600,000 in the Baltic states, and the Baltic states are not very big populated, so yeah. it's a huge, yeah. huge amount for them. When you, when you encounter a story <clears throat> like this, while you work on something else, you encounter something else, you keep it in mind, what is the decision at that one point to decide to make it into a photo book? Uh, what is the, the reason behind thinking that the photo book in, for this story is the best medium to get it across? Um, uh, I think f because I want to, to document and preserve something what is... Um, if, if I don't interview these people now, they, they will die and we, we cannot have that stories anymore. Yeah. So to preserve that stories for future generations, a photo book is for me a very good yeah. uh, medium. Yeah. Give them a long lasting yes. position in history. Yes. Yeah. Is, is the, um, they would sometimes say photojournalism is the first uh, way of, of uh, recording history. For you, a documentary work like this is, is going beyond that first stage and, and, and really mapping out the whole story. Um, in this case, yes, because, but also because I found during my, my research, I found so much uh, interesting and, and important uh, archive material that, that, um, yeah. uh, that, that made it uh, into this book. Yeah. And then, uh, five books? Why, why, why did you make five books? Because of the huge amount of uh, material yeah. I found. First, I, I, when I started about this topic, I thought about one book for all three countries. But then I saw that there's so much interesting material that it is good to make a uh, trilogy. And then about Lithuania, it became so much uh, footage that, that uh, it became five books. And it's an interesting time travel. It starts with, um, yeah, it depends, of course, which book you take first. But um, in time, I think it starts with illustrations, uh, draw, uh, drawings that were made by people who uh, uh, were forced to work in Siberia. Yeah, the, the, f the first book for me, the, the first you have the little index so that you can find your way in, in the five books. Then you have the book um, Rimantas. And it is a uh, kind of introduction in the history of the Baltic states. And it is um, based on one family, on, on one archive uh, photo album from one family, which tells the whole line till the 90s. Uh, very, for me, it's a very emotional story also. Then the second book starts with drawings from uh, one person who survived the deportation and uh, when the man became older he drew very precisely what he remembered from when he was 70 year, seven years old because he was a child when he was uh, deported and th this drawings show us what we cannot see in photos because n nobody took photos there in, in that time and the second part of uh, that book is a bit difficult maybe to explain now because the I have to explain something else first. The, the topic I choose for this book are the deportations to the Laptev Sea. And I choose that location because it, for me it was the most um, 
harsh place where you can send women and children to. It's, it's in the polar region and they, they were sent there without clothing, uh, without any preparation. They had to build, when they arrived, they had to build their, their houses by hand while it was freezing already. And in this second uh, part after the drawings, you see photos from when they returned in the 80s. So in they, when they returned, they uh, wanted to dig out the uh, family members who died there to bring them home in their home soil. That was after the fall of the Berlin Wall, etc., right? Uh, or Ju it was just before. It was end of okay. the 80s. Okay. And there were, there were two, um, two uh, expeditions to do different places where they dig out the uh, relatives. Uh, quite amazing that it was possible. At, at one stage, you decide to go for the, 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 the historic material, the, the, the drawings, then you add photography that you find, you, f you add your own photography. A photo book has the word photo in it. And um, how would you describe yourself? Uh, are, you, are you purely a photographer? Or uh, nowadays what you see is a lot of books are also made uh, by artists. How do you describe yourself as a storyteller? Does it matter? Um, n no, it, I, I, I use what, what I find and what is, what is the most important to, uh, to, to tell that story. And if, if the, that includes drawings and archive material, then it's that, mm. but it's not, um, it's it, in the next book, I would maybe not choose for, for, for drawings yeah. or whatever. Then you would go purely for your own photography. Yeah, it, so it depends on the story. What is the best way to tell that story? Yeah. And I think that comes also from from my background, from from the art yeah. time that I always look. What what do you need to tell a story? You were educated as an artist, and uh, later on you uh, decided to educate yourself as a photographer. Yeah I, yeah, I followed the photo academy in Amsterdam, and, and specific to for documentary photography. What what made you being drawn by photography as an artist? Um, uh, to go to a school is to be able to know the craft. Um, why why did you move towards photography? For uh, it it uh, the the. Um, the move was, uh, I, in my artwork, I used very often, uh, if I saw a photo in a newspaper about a, an important topic, then I used that photo to, to reflect on it and to, to work it out. And somewhere inside there was the wish or the dream to go out myself and to make that photos. Yeah. So uh, somewhere the, the switching point came that that would be my better place. And another thing, important thing, is I like to tell stories, and art is not the good way. It's not the place to tell stories. Documentary, yeah. is it? So a documentary photographer slash artist. Yes. Yeah. But it's a it's a enormous lot of work that you have been doing for this project. Also for your previous book, Wallace Kinder, you were already, it costed you a mm, few years? A few years, yes. Yeah. So it's a thorough research that you yes. do first? For, for this, is, uh, I spend a year on research in the, in the different countries and archives, and then uh, I develop the plan how I would like to do it, and then I, I search for funding and realize it. What I thought was Brilliant. Uh, you have uh, six people who play uh, an important part. Mm -hmm. So it gives you a possibility as a reader to really uh, personify yourself mm -hmm. uh, and get into the story yes. because you know you, you get to know somebody and then you get into it. So it's so you have the the thorough research at first mm -hmm. and the impressive information, etc., and then. But it, start, it all starts with uh, oral history by yes. individual. Yes, that's very important for me because the, the historical part is, is only the framework, but the, what people experienced and what they, uh, how they how they deal with that past and how they survived, that is the most important for me to ask them and to try to show. 
must cost you a lot of energy to to uh, to get the story out and to uh, to also deal with the emotions that that touch you too, I guess. Yes, but I but I but that's okay. <laughs> that's absolutely <laughs> fine. I that's I I like that um, very much, or I I appreciate that very much. That uh, if people give me so much trust to share so so deep uh, traumatic uh, stories. And but, but I you, I do visit them. The six people I visited a couple of times. So you build up uh, uh, trust, and um, I I know very well what is from myself and what is from the other one. And you do need to know that in this work, because I can I never sleep bad because of what I heard. Mm -hmm. And you and what. You also don't have to forget that the, the situations when, when we have these interviews, when they are finished, we have coffee and we have uh, dinner. And so it's also the, the, the talks are heavy, but the contact is very light and warm. And mm. and, but you also have a, a certain responsibility to tell the story in the right way. Yes. Or, yeah. yes. Yeah, so this research also has this implication of verifying stories and looking into it. Is that some... That's very much connected to journalism verification. Is that also your approach in your research that you, the things that you uh, attach to the story and that you put in the book are, is that a journalistic part of it in the uh, storytelling? Yeah, yes. And I'm, I'm very uh, st strict. I cannot check every detail what they tell me, of course. It's, mm. it's oral history and it's their memory. So, the, of course, things can, can change. But for the rest, I need for myself to check all the, the yeah. facts if if, uh, if it is correct. It must be a, a a a research that leads from one story to the other story because if it has been so many, it's six hundred thousand people. There's like multiple storylines yeah. there. So uh, where does this end and where does it stop? Is that the decision that you make that that part will be in the book and the, the other? Ones don't. Yeah, that, that that's a difficult decision because there I there, there are really many interesting stories. I could continue for for a long time, but that's why for for this book I choose the the location Laptevsi. So the stories about the Laptevsi come into the book and not the deportation to mm. Tajikistan or to. Yeah. So I had to make it a clear choice and to follow that clear yeah. choice. And the next books also have about the Latvian and Estonian also have a very uh, clear choice with a different angle to, to, to yeah. tell about the story. And you're already researching on those subjects, I guess. Yes, the, for, the, um, for one book I already traveled uh, to Kazakhstan. So I already uh, took the photos and the interviews, so I'm working out that part. And for the third part, I have to wait uh, until I can travel to Siberia again. So I have to park that yeah. for a while. Um, when can we expect those other books? The part um, two and three? The, 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 mm, I don't know yet. Oh, <laughs> I think it sounds like I a wise should, answer. It should be... A, in one year, there definitely should be the next book finished. Yeah. And I hope in one and a half year, the, the third, yeah. when the exhibition comes. Due to the corona situation, um, uh, your exhibition on this first uh, project it's has been postponed? Was, yeah, but the exhibition will be about the whole project, not oh, about okay. this, so about all three parts. Where will the, the exhibition take place? In the photo museum in Rotterdam. In Rotterdam, yes. photo museum. Yeah. I I have a final uh, question. You uh, the the books are there. The stories are in it. What is the most important feedback that you got from the people connected to it when they have seen it or when they have learned about it? I I, I was uh, very happy that I just before the lockdown I could travel to to Vilnius to have a book presentation there. And uh, for them, it is uh, important that it is not uh, um, only a topic which is inside the Baltic states, but which is getting outside yeah. the Baltic states. It is recognition and, and that they, they, they were very happy with it. Yeah, good. Impact. Yeah.
think. And I, I, I would, you asked one question before, you, um, because it is a lot of archive material and drawings. Yeah. And about my own photos, but then, so you have the drawings and you have the interviews and the next two parts about are my photos from traveling to that regions yeah. and which you see here. So now, I, now, now I've learned from this last that you see yourself as a photographer. Yes, because of that course. Is <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> thank Super. you so much, Claudia. Claudia, thank you. Yes, thank you. The uh, next uh, uh, photographer that we introduce is uh, the photographer Lam Yik Fei. Yeah. Lam Yik Fei is a one of the most important photojournalists in uh, Southeast Asia, having photographed the uh, protest in Hong Kong, almost everything, working for the New York Times, and uh, a great storyteller and an important uh, uh, photographer to bring us the, the story of the protest that take place in, in Hong Kong. And as a start, we will uh, look at a little introduction video about his work in Hong Kong. Due to uh, technical uh, situations, um, Lam Yik Fei is uh, the invisible photographer here today, unfortunately. Um, but um, well, uh, uh, I can tell a little bit about him. He was born in '86. Uh, that means he's in the beginning of his uh, 30s. Uh, has been working seven months on the on the demonstrations in uh, Hong Kong, and um, yeah, he, he thought it was time to make a photo book out yeah. of it. Last uh, time we had a live cast, we also showed the work of Ivor Prickett. Yeah. Lam Yik Fei is also now working on a photo book. This is really starting to, to, to be a big part of uh, photo books now, uh, photo journalism, and then a long-term project uh, spun out into a photo book. Yeah. Is, do you see this also in this, in this line of work? Yeah, I think so. It's uh, on one hand, it's kind of basic photojournalistic uh, work. Um, like you, uh, yeah, in this case, you work seven months, you get a lot of pictures. In the old days, I would say you would have a box of photos and then you put a hardcover around it and then you have a book. Um, in this case, um, we also have a super relevant story. I mean, there is this definition uh, uh, once uh, put into words by John Gossage, a famous photographer. Uh, you can read it in, uh, in Martin Parr's uh, book on photo books. And it says that a photo book um, has a good photography, um, a relevant story, and brought into a design that makes it a little bit bigger than the two other parts are. Um, of course, there will be good photography, and good photography is, of course, also always relative. For some people, it can be archival material. In the case of uh, Fay, it's uh, good traditional photojournalism. And it's a super relevant story, of course, because Hong Kong is in a small spot in this super huge country, China, that is getting more and more power every second. And, uh, and they're pushing Hong Kong back, uh, it, it, it's, uh, as it seems. He has started uh, what I find fascinating. Mm. Uh, I'm always drawn by the, the business side also of how <laughs> finance the photo yeah, sure. books. Uh, how do you important. do that? Uh, yeah. Because uh, yeah. a photo book is an expensive yeah. 
means to an end. Yeah. Uh, but he started a crowdfunding campaign, yeah. which has been Massive. incredibly successful. Oh, he, um, he did it on Kickstarter indeed. And um, yeah, in, in Hong Kong uh, dollars, it sounds even fantastic. It's one and a half million uh, Hong Kong dollars. But nevertheless, it's um, um, 184,000 euros. Yeah. And I think I n almost never met a photographer who needed that much money uh, yeah. to, to make a photo book. I mean, it's, uh, it's yeah. fantastic. Is he already there? Um, yes, he's already there. And uh, 2,850 people back to him. So you could buy a book or you could buy a book and a print. And I think about uh, 1,800 people already ordered a book. And uh, so another 1,000 ordered a book and something extra with it. This is incredible. So you haven't made a book yet. And already you, bought, you sold 3,000 copies, more or yeah. less. And that's, that's uh, in the photo book world, uh, it doesn't happen often. Most photo books are being published now in 1,000, 1,500. Yeah, yeah, maybe even 500 yeah. is, uh, or 750 is more and more happening. And it, of course, proves that the story is relevant because most people who buy it are people from Hong Kong who want to have a memory in a book about what, uh, what happened uh, last year. Visual reference of a, a time yeah. in... Uh, the book is called uh, War Young. I am not sure if I uh, say that right. It's, uh, it's a Cantonese uh, combination of two words, uh, peaceful and uh, valiant, so powerful. So, and that is um, also a characterization of uh, the protests in uh, Hong Kong. They were, well, not always peaceful, but well, let's not elaborate on that. Uh, uh, it has many uh, uh, aspects. Um, but uh, well, of course, most people were peaceful and also powerful because they want to stay in Hong Kong and they want to enjoy their freedom forever. Mm -hmm. As a photojournalist, uh, will this book be a statement also about his position or what do you expect? Yeah, I think so. Uh, what, what exactly do you mean with his position? Well, uh, yeah, uh, uh, photojournalism is connected by being independent, uh, yeah. neutral. Yeah. Uh, of course, that has become quite uh, difficult to be yeah. always neutral because yeah. the point of view that you take is there. Yeah. Do you expect this book to also be a statement in itself? Yeah, neutral, new, neutrality doesn't exist, I guess. And especially in this case, it's clear he is a uh, member of uh, the people from Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And he also says that in his own introduction, um, he lives there, he grew up there, he was born there, and he wants to stay there in a situation of freedom. So he's with the demonstrators. Um, and um, I don't think you need to be neutral. Um, of course, you could also, I mean, how would you do a subject like this uh, neutral? It's almost impossible. Um, all, uh, although it might be interesting to have a look at the other side where mm. uh, uh, um, uh, the police or uh, semi-military uh, groups um, are uh, following the demonstrators. Um, but uh, uh, we would be interested in how that would go, but I'm not sure if photographers would be allowed to, to, to get too close to that. Yeah. Let's see. What you saw in that short movie already, uh, you see these uh, police uh, people pushing the photographer away. Yeah, mm -hmm. interesting. Let's yeah. wait and see. Yeah. Uh, Fai coming soon, they say, but uh, yes, in large I'm, quantities. Yes, and, I'm, I'm, and I will definitely have it in the bookshop uh, probably within a week or three or uh, something. You can already order if you would like to. Let's all go to PhotoCube bookshop. Now open in the weekend, if you're in Amsterdam. Yes. Next, um, uh, a guest in uh, our uh, program. Two guests. Two guests. Um, let's bring them forward. Yeah. Um, they will uh, walk to the stage. And while they approach uh, the stage, then uh, I can uh, introduce uh, the, their, their work. Um, Robert Knot. Robert Knot and Antoinette de Jong. Um, they are a duo, and eight years after their uh, now legendary publication, Poppy, The Trails of Afghan Heroin, Robert Knot and Antoinette de Jong finished their next long-term project, Tree and Soil. I have it here. It is fantastic and it's beautiful. Go take a look at it. Um, after the nuclear disaster in 2011, they photographed and filmed the changing landscapes in the close zone about around Fukushima over a period of five years. And they documented, evacuated farmhouses, gardens, agricultural fields, 
surrounding hills and forests, and they interviewed former inhabitants of the area. Welcome. Five years in Fukushima and surroundings. Wow. Um, quite a journey, Antoinette. Yeah, uh, wonderful journeys. But we didn't stay there for five years. We made several trips to the areas uh, in different seasons over the years. And um, the nuclear disaster in Fukushima was the starting point of the journey. Um, but ultimately the story is about how man relates to nature, how mm. mankind relates to nature. Mm. Uh, you know, we try to um, uh, investigate it, explore it, label it. Uh, we try to control it, dominate it. And um, uh, ultimately, uh, this book is about, well, the project is about uh, the apparent inability of mankind to be part of nature uh, and uh, to see himself as part of nature mm. instead of separate from it. Yeah. Why do, why, why do we suffer from that inability? I don't know, fear, I guess. Mm. Uh, uh, in a way, uh, Japan has many similarities with the Netherlands, where we come from. Uh, a, a lot of the landscape is designed entirely, uh, the, the entire landscape is designed, every square inch of it. Um, the forests had almost disappeared in the 17th century, chopped down for building big castles and warship. And uh, uh, that instigated or what was uh, the sort of starting point of a policy of uh, conserving uh, the forests and nature, and uh, which led to a quite interesting harmonic way of living, you know, for the villagers with the surrounding areas. And uh, we thought this aspect was really interesting. So... Um, when we spoke to people there, um, they felt very cut off from the area. Uh, they were evacuated, couldn't return to their houses. And this pain somehow we try to capture in the project. So that's what we try to do. And where, where, where are these people staying? I mean, we, we don't see people in their book, uh, but, so, um, but just uh, curious, where do they stay at the moment? Uh, Many people have, were initially ev evacuated to uh, Fukushima city and to several other areas because uh, there wasn't just a nuclear disaster but also the tsunami that preceded that. So hundreds of thousands of people uh, were affected and they are now all over the country and as far as Fukushima is concerned, many people have started a new life um, in another place and cannot or or don't wish to return to uh, the area. Mm. Robert, um, you've been photographing nuclear, well, the aftermath of nuclear disasters or industry mm -hmm. for a long time. When you were still a photojournalist, yes, or are you still are you still a photojournalist? Well, I think the. The basis of our work is still the classical reportage. So you go out into the field, you photograph, you video, we, we, we video people, we do a lot of audio re recordings. Antoinette has worked for more than 20 years for radio. Uh, and of course you write. Um, so that's still the basis of our projects. Uh, once we collected all the material, we just go and sit down and work with book designers. And then you have about a phase of about one and a half, two years to really sit down and discuss and think, what is this really? Is this story about? Um, um, also with our previous book, Poppy, uh, we try to move away from the daily news, from the uh, from the current affairs, and 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 add a few extra layers, which are much more about you know uh, uh, the human condition rather than what has happened or is happening. At that moment. Bobby was a book about uh, the heroin trade. 
yeah, with its bases in Afghanistan. I think right? the primary layer was the worldwide trade of Afghan heroin and its fallout. But underneath that was a much bigger story about globalization and how that has affected organized crime and how organized crime and war are now a very happy marriage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I interrupted you. Uh, yeah, no, so, 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 um, um, so we tried to move away and, and, and turn the entire project into a far more universal theme, uh, which, which relates to everybody, basically. Yeah. And then you use, uh, as we see it in the background, you use many other layers, uh, not just your own photography, not just your own story, but you also refer to uh, traditional Japanese culture. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where you take the liberty to aggregate multiple visuals, multiple stories, poetry mm -hmm. into it. And in, on your website, you describe itself as visual arts. And this uh, space of technology and digital has opened up all these layers. Uh, why do why do you feel uh, that uh, why do you feel liberated in that? Is photography not enough? Um, I wouldn't say that. It really depends on the project, and it really depends on your story. If 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 you're the classical photojournalist, it's more than enough. Uh, but for us, it was also a way of of um, uh, keeping our own work fresh and and interesting. It, for us, it doesn't make sense to do the same type of work. 25 years, 20 years. Um, so for us, it was a very interesting way of, of renewing and refreshing ourselves. And and uh, But what we found, because with the previous pro project, we also used a lot of footage from YouTube and, and, and other sources. So And moving away from your own work um, uh, enhances or gives you the possibility to... to uh, add new layers into the story mm. for instance the, the 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 pictures of of the japanese ghosts um it's basically yeah the classical japanese themes about uh, ghosts in the wood uh, but they all represent nature in one way or another they're all, all classical fairy tales and and stories with all re, uh, which all tell a story about how people relate to their environment and of course, nature is scary, and and so you have the ghosts uh, representing that, and um, and of course that also relates to Fukushima, which is also a ghost in an area you can't see radiation, you can't smell it, but it affects people's lives. It 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 affects the landscape itself because it's not maintained anymore by people. Uh, so it's this invisible ghost. Um, so it's nice to visualize that through old pictures from a long time ago. Yeah. One of your uh, fans uh, was in the bookshop yesterday, <laughs> uh, has already uh, bought the book, also in the in the crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. And uh, what uh, struck me is that he said, uh, yeah, this is something else. And uh, it really takes an effort for me to go into it. Is that what is that what you want? If you bring this together, you want to tell a story, a story needs to get across. But it's also important that people take time to really get into it and understand it. I think it is very much part of this project, of this particular project, because it is it is also about taking the time to wander around in that forest, so to speak, to uh, to be there, to get lost, to uh, en have encounters, maybe with the ghosts, maybe sometimes with. Uh, a witness of the area, a priest that gives you an insight, another uh, a few statements from uh, the people who live there are there. So it is very much of um, allowing people to have their own experience. Mm -hmm. So that was part of the project. We started with loads of interviews with uh, more, far more text, and in the end we stripped it back to what it is now. Yeah. You work uh, with a team. You're already a team yeah. uh, with the two of you, but you work with a team. Iris Sicking for mm -hmm. uh, working on the imagery, then a, a, the design of the book. Um, Kummer and Herman. Kummer Kummer and Herman. And Herman. Mm -hmm. How important is that? All this work together and crafting it together, also designing it. Yeah, it's very close cooperation uh, and uh, there have been a lot of edits. Um, 
Maybe you can reflect on yeah, that. Yeah, we, we started editing back in 2015 or even 16. Uh, and we made an initial dummy, which is uh, only landscapes and interviews and text. And, and that just didn't work. So we kind of frustrated through the whole project <laughs> into the corner. And, and, and it took us a, probably w a, about a year and a half before we uh, 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 picked it up again mm. because we were busy with other work. And, and uh, we discovered the work from Seabold, which is uh, a, a German physician who worked on the Dutch trading post in Deshima in the 19th century. Yeah. And, and he has this beautiful collection of, of wild plants, wild animals. Mm. Uh, and he also um, uh, commissioned Japanese artists to to uh, make these beautiful paintings and block prints of 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 nature in Japan. Um, and that work fitted very neatly into our own project. Um, um, of course, it's clear you can see from his entire collection, which is is kept by Naturalis in Leiden and that he really cherished Japanese nature and, and he fell in love with the country as we did when we um, went there for the first time. Um, yeah, how is that? Uh, you're foreigners and you go to Japan. Isn't that strange? Why, 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 why don't you leave that to people from Japan? Why should I? <laughs> okay, not a random <laughs> question. No, that's um, good. <laughs> um, no, it's 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 something. Uh, it was almost unavoidable that we went to Fukushima because we, mm -hmm. our first book together, we we worked on 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 four major nuclear disasters in the former Soviet Union. So it was almost in, inevitable that we went to Fukushima. Um, uh, so that drew us to Japan. It wasn't spe specifically Japan, but once we were there, we we just fell in love with it yeah. straight away. Shall we just take a look at the design of the book? I mean, it's, uh, as, as, you, as, we, as, it's been, as it is being called, it's an object. So mm -hmm. it's not just a book with pages that you leave through, uh, but it's more than that. Maybe you can, uh, we can fold open the cover. Yeah. Try that, I haven't done it before. Let's see <laughs> what comes out of that. Let's see if you can try and fold it back. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be the challenge. Yeah. I, uh, it's, okay. it's, uh, it's very, very rich and uh, visually very rich, but it also has so many layers, fold outs, mm -hmm. um, uh, poetry in it. Um, I, it must be a challenge to either limit yourself or to extra put extra things in it constantly. Is that something that, uh, are you happy at the end with this balance between fold outs, things together? Um? I th yeah, I, th I am. Uh, it was difficult at first to maybe let go of certain elements, but like I said, uh, you know, the, the text has been cut out a lot. and uh, But it works better this way, I think, because now you have this... Uh, forest you start wandering around in and you, your curiosity is triggered in a different way. Right. Uh, it's, it's not photojournalism. Um, it's really meant to trigger the need of people to maybe even be in a forest and... Uh, and yeah, find something there. We want it to be to make the book a real physical experience. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why we have the fold-out pages. Um, um, and I think it, it works really well. And, and um, yeah, I think we've made about 20, 25 edits of the book. So it was, you know, yes. sending them up and down with the designers and, and yeah. lots of half talks year, and meetings. One year, one and a half year. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was quite difficult to find a balance between the work from Seabold and our own work. Uh, but I, I think in the end, it, 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 it's indeed a very rich book. Yeah. Uh, Final question. It's, uh, it's a book. It's a beautiful book. It is very rich. There are not many copies of it. I think only 400 are available for us to, to buy. And I think it's selling fast. Yeah. That's it. It's a beautiful, small document, 1100 at max. What else do you want to get? Five years work 
into one beautiful book. What is the other there's part a, there's of... There's also an exhibition, there which go. is a, an audiovisual installation. And uh, because of Corona, we uh, had to postpone the exhibition in uh, Vienna, mm -hmm. which uh, was supposed to be on right now in Kunsthaus uh, Wien Museum Hundertwasser. Mm -hmm. And uh, next year, early next year, we're going to have an exhibition in Photo Museum Den Haag and also in uh, Germany. Good. So there's, yeah, it's, that's going to be in at least three places, which is great. And that's an entirely different experience. It's a combination of prints, but uh, with the audiovisual installation. And we, um, we made uh, video recordings, uh, very static shots where, where, when and we've slowed down time, we've slowed down sound. So you get this sense of a very slow development in the landscape, which is what we try to uh, reach. And um, it, it works very well, I think. Yeah. Let's go all see it in Vienna, The Hague, and the third Wurzburg. one was? Würzburg. I can see the way you talk about it, how you enjoy making that and so we're looking forward to also yeah. go but she's the that. she's the radio maker so she loves taking time i guess yes. <laughs> yeah no but 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 it was uh I, I mean we spent hours just listening to the japanese nightingale which isn't japanese by the way but it was beautiful and you <laughs> just spend hours in the field just listening to we don't have hours okay but we thank you very much and we look forward to enjoy the book and the exhibitions and thank uh, you. extremely well done thank you very thank much thank you it was yes. a pleasure thank you yeah. Well, let's uh, go to our last guest, Yannick Bouilly. As it sounds, he is from France. Um, he is the founder of Off Print, uh, the book fair that started ten years, maybe longer. Um, ten years. Ten years. Um, uh, going uh, coinciding with uh, the Paris Photo uh, Fair. And also, since a few years, uh, connected to uh, Photo London. Yannick, you're welcome. Thank uh, you. We were talking about several kinds of photo books and developments that are going on in, uh, let's say, the last 10 years. Um, you're the expert. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you also had a few titles that you would like to show us and give a direction maybe to get to a conclusion. Yannick. Yeah, Yannick. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm the checking the, the, the cover. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, for me, because uh, uh, there's so many, uh, a huge diversity of photo books, yeah. I was thinking, how can I uh, picture something that is relevant today in the context of uh, what's going on in the US, and which is appearing in a way that is all social networks. And I found this book, which was a, a, a book from the 60s, in... Uh, uh, published in South Africa by activists on a demonstration against the apartheid in the US, in the South Africa, sorry. And it's very interesting because it's actually about the same context as today with George Floyd, uh, the documentation of a police repression, uh, which has been turned into a book and was massively produced and massively sold and had also of course, an, an impact on the, the, the consideration of the apartheid, but a very slow impact because, of course, in the 60s, 1960s, this book, it's very, uh, took us so like 30 years or 40 years to change the situation. So even it was documented, even it was uh, sent over, and especially in Europe, to make the problem known. And even people knew about this with this photograph was taken during the demonstration, and they are very brutal, very rude, because you see the demonstration with family, children, and the police starting to shoot at the people and killing quite many. Even this had an impact, but also no impact, because it took 40 years to change the situation there, 30 years. How many lives were taken during that massacre? Uh, I don't know. If you see the picture, uh, I'm not sure about it. I didn't check, but obviously, quite many because mm -hmm. if you yeah. we only have a selection of pictures in the book but when you think when you turn the pages you see quite many yeah. uh, it's a huge field maybe later we're going to see some other pictures it's a huge field with a lot of dead bodies so probably 
30, 40, 50, I don't know, yep. 70, and just randomly starting shooting, uh, you're going to see also dead children. Uh, and the, 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 the question is that what's the influence of those kind of documentation, which are very really raw, because it's actually uh, written by someone who was there, on the society uh, today. And I was thinking that's interesting because the George Floyd has the same impact. It's also something which has been there for many years. Now, very obviously, everywhere in the news. But is it enough to have the videos and the content and the, 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 the murdering of this George Floyd online to change the things? Uh, I don't know, but it's very... Uh, 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 yeah, the future will tell us, I exactly. guess. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Although I think... So, it's, it's, I mean, images are not enough, but they're also necessary. That's what I meant with this. Mm. Yeah, great. Do you see the role of the photo book also to, to play a role in that? I mean, we just spoke about Yamlik Fay and how he uses his photography to, to get this story across. Yeah, the, the photo book, what is interesting with the photo book, of course, George Floyd is a very interesting example because it's all online. Yep. It's just a girl, I think she was 17 years old, taping with the iPhone the, the killing of this person, which is also interesting because you see that the policemen are not even aware that they are being filmed with someone which is just two meters further. So you still see that there's like a not really a good perception of what is being filmed and the perception of being documented. But the future of the photo book, I was, that was also a very interesting case, is that actually I thought, is it a question of being printed or not? Or is it actually a question of being uh, able to find spaces where you can uh, uh, put some critical content? Mm. And social networks are also today very, very keen for this and very key place for this. But I was thinking, is that really also places where you really have like a freedom on your space where you are? Basically, those social networks, they are also companies and they are also not really something you can consider as public spaces. So you don't really have the control on this. Uh, while printed matters, somehow you have a total control on this. So on one side, you have this issue of being very relevant today as printed matters. But on the other side, you also have the freedom of not being relevant, not being very under the radar. And on that side, being very able to do whatever you want. If you look at the fair that are, that are organized, they are quite crowded, quite many publishers. Mm -hmm. The sellers are very good, yeah. but it's very printed. And I was thinking, why is that so popular, so successful? And I think probably because commercially, the printed things is less interesting for people. So it becomes again a space for freedom and probably where you can see a sort of radicality yeah. that actually tend to be less and less yeah. possible on social networks. I mean, Facebook, Instagram, they are bringing more and more filters, more and more control, which is also a question of making a space which, which is meant to be public, less and less yeah. public, and actually rather private. Yeah, so in a book, an individual can tell whatever he wants. Exactly. You had more examples, right? Mm. This one is also a good one. It's also... This one is less about having spaces where you mm. can really uh, 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 express yourself. And I think the current tension uh, in the US, but also in Europe with right extreme, is because you are lacking spaces uh, uh, for expressing your voice. And in that sense, the idea of Lars actually to open a bookshop, to have a festival, to open spaces were really key because it was, it's all about this giving spaces. And, um, What's but that was not here, only right? question. So a postcard now, see a gletcher. Yeah. Well, what is and this? It, but the question of space is not only one. That's also the question: the way of documenting. Mm -hmm. And this one is very interesting. Artist book by an artist, but she has been collecting postcards of the iceberg, the glacier, the iceberg yeah. in uh, the Alps Fale in France. Uh, Corinne Vionnet. Corinne Vionnet. Yeah. And she has been collecting this over the years, and she realized that since it has been documented, the iceberg is actually. Uh, 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 getting smaller and smaller. So it's always the same angle, always the same postcard. But if you take the first one, like 100 years ago, you have a very massive ice block in front of the picture. And from the same angle, because they always take the same picture, this company, from the same angle, the Incredible. same place, after 550 years, you have almost nothing as a space yeah. anymore. Mm. And uh, other books? Uh, the other one is Astronomical by Ish Kainer, which is really beautiful because yeah. he makes 
This is only possible in a book. He actually, if you put the next picture, he took, uh, 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 he printed one page for each kilometer from here to the sun. And he decided each kilometer I'm going to print one page. And basically what you get is that every kilometer makes like about 10 volumes before going from here to the, uh, yeah. to the sun. And it's all about the idea of, where, and sometimes like, I think the three, third or fourth volume, you have one planet appearing. So it's just to show that we're actually totally alone in the planet. Yeah. And it's also another way to document and bring sort of distortion in the reality to make us conscious of where we are in the space. Lars, I think uh, you're sitting uh, a bit tense. No. Yeah, well, I wish we could go to the sun and back about photo books, but uh, that's, <laughs> we can that's, talk uh, forever about it. That, that, yeah. Then we should do this because Yannick, uh, uh, you have so much to share about the uh, photo books. Uh, thank you for sharing uh, two of the, the main ones. There's many, much more. Uh, I think we should make another one about photo books, but we have to sure. We'll finalize continue. We'll it. We'll continue. Um, Adi, thank you for being here, uh, with us. Yannick, uh, also thank you for sharing for your thoughts invitation. about the future of the photo book. This was Livecast 3 photo book. We thank uh, our, our main sponsors of uh, World Press Photo, PwC, Egon, and uh, the Nationale Postcode Lotterij. And, uh, and please come to uh, the bookshop. Photo Cube Bookshop <laughs> is open. Saturdays and Sundays, we are open again from tomorrow. More photo books. Yeah. Thank you. Merci. Thanks. Merci. Thank you.